Great. So um, thanks, Ajahn Brahm, for agreeing to answer a few questions. This is on behalf of some of our friends on the Facebook who um, I, I, I offered to put to these. Service. Great. Thank you. So quite a few of these are about um, coping in times of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the first one's from Jackie and she asks... Oh, easy. <laughs> Jackie's asking, how can I keep calm and overcome the panic and dread that comes up when I go to work in social care? It's hard to cope with the emotional toll of caring for people who are fearful and sometimes angry. Um, I meditate and feel calm, but I find it difficult to keep that feeling once I'm back in work. So what to do is every now and again you have a minute or maybe even 30 seconds of your own time, when people aren't asking you a question, they're not demanding your time, you just uh, close your eyes, or you say, I'm just going to check something on the computer or whatever, sit down on a desk, close your eyes, and do a one-minute meditation. And yeah. one-minute meditation is just coming right into this present moment, mm. and realizing you're here, you're alive. Anxiety just makes it much worse, and more chance of you getting sick, and other people getting sick. So you just... Relax the body, make the whole body very loose and very easy. And just do it for one minute or 30 seconds. And then you go and uh, do the work. And have as many of those 30 seconds or one minute meditations as you can possibly squeeze in every day. Great. You just you, you centre back into what's really important. There's too many people getting anxious about uh, COVID. And so because of that anxiety, it makes the results much worse. Okay, that's lovely. Um, and then Deb was asking um, that when someone's passing away from COVID-19, um, in England they often pass away alone. How can the person yeah. who's dying and the family best cope with this? So often, outside of COVID time, that uh, this is a general uh, phenomenon which happens again and again and again. People are by the bedside next to their loved one when they're supposed to be dying, and they're waiting and waiting and waiting, and the person's not dying. They could die any time. They haven't died yet. So they say, oh, let's just go and get a quick snack, a bit, bit of dinner. And as soon as they get out of the room, the person dies. It's like dying is a personal time. Mm. And really the family be better, you know, if the family weren't there at all anyway, mm -hmm. at all times. To put the family say goodbye, that's nice to have uh, seen you or whatever else it is, and then the actual the dying process is much better done alone. It's a powerful moment in your journeys from one life to another. It's best done in peace mm -hmm. and in calm and in solitude. And people have chosen to do that so often. Mm -hmm. You see, when the family are around, they keep the other person going, and it's torture for the other person you know, who wants to die. They just say, can you please get out of here for a few moments? And I'm busy, I'm dying. So that's one reason why that it's not such a bad thing to die alone. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure about you, Venerable, but myself, I'd much rather, I've got no plans, by the way, <laughs> of dying in the next year or two years or ten years. Ooh, but good. if I did die, it'd be much better just to sit quietly mm -hmm. and to do that dying process in silence and solitude with hardly anyone around. Yeah. So it's not a bad thing. And anyway, after you do die, um, you know, a lot of time people come visiting, visiting mm. you. I said that in a talk somewhere recently mm -hmm. where there was this gentleman, he was an English fellow, and his mother was very sick in Essex, and he lived just around the, around the corner from our city centre. And one evening, middle of the night, he woke up. Something was strange. He turned on his light, and his mother literally at the end of his bed, and very clear, no sort of hazy thing at all, as if she was actually standing there, a real body, the whole from the top of her hair to the tips of her toes, very clear silently smiling at him mm. and she knew it was a ghost she knew her mum must, must have died one of the most beautiful things she said in his life he had his about five or six minutes of being with his mum at the end of her life and he was over in Perth mm. and she died over in Essex <laughs> and he was a sort of fellow that he wasn't he was far from being crazy a very 
straight down the line, English guy. So he just, after she disappeared, never said anything. He was just so happy, just seeing his mum for five or six minutes. And after she passed away, after she disappeared, made himself a cup of tea, as good English people do. And then phone call came. Pete, I've got some bad news for you. Yeah, he said, yeah, mum's dead. How did you know? They'd just come back from the hospital. So I don't know about separation, mm. distances. When it comes to dying and death, if something else happens. It doesn't really matter where you are, where they are. You just wish them well on their continuing journey. Mm. Thank you, that's really lovely. Okay, there's another one about um, covid so given the devastating effect on us, on our friends and family, how can we balance frustrations with the actions of authorities, particularly in England and America, whilst maintaining a healthy outlook? Oh, look, when anything just doesn't go the way you expect it or you want it, you always want to blame somebody. Mm. And you know, those poor authorities, they're trying their best, they make mistakes... So the authorities aren't enlightened beings. They've got their greed, hatred, and delusions. They're trying to do their best. They're stressed. They're, sometimes they can't make the right decision because the right decision is not there to be made anyway. And there's so many other sort of things they have to deal with. It's like, you know, why can't they, like a, a, a referee on a football match, make the right decisions? Why do they need all this other technology to make the right decisions, which sometimes spoil the flow of the match? But this is our life. It's okay to make mistakes. Yeah. And don't blame people. And they're trying their very best. Under stress, in very trying situations, they don't get it right. And so don't get angry and pass the blame onto others. We just have to accept this is human life. We live in an imperfect world. And our job and reality in this world is to learn. To learn forgiveness, and kindness, learn how to make the best use of every moment we have in this world. We never know when the last moment will be, but don't waste the moments we have with blaming and uh, negativity. Instead, just let's forgive, let's be kind, and let's understand if you were in that position, you had to make those decisions, you'd make mistakes as well. Mm -hmm. So that way we can have a beautiful Dharma, good teachings in our mind to learn from this time. I often say that the most difficult teachers I had uh, at school, the ones I didn't like, were the ones I learned the most from. <laughs> so the difficult times in people's lives, they're the ones where wisdom, compassion, have the greatest opportunities to grow. So grow them. Okay. Um, okay. Um, how, at this time, when we're bombarded with everybody's perception of how to deal with the global crisis, um, can we help to retrain our mind to see and understand things according to right view? Uh, in other words, don't listen to the news. <laughs> oh, well, you've got to listen to some of the news, but some of the so-called experts, experts, they don't know what's going on. It's just like the people who try and forecast the weather. And they don't know what's going on, so they only say, like, there's a 5% chance of rain today, or the 20% chance, which means, well, you know, it was uncertain. We don't know which way it's going to go. So you'd be something like that. One of the great things with right view is to understand uncertainty. This world, we don't know which way it's going to evolve. You don't know which way it's going to evolve. But the best thing we can do for our future is understand our future is being made in our present moment. So remember to make this moment as beautiful, as serving for yourself and others as you possibly can. And worrying about a future is uncertain. It's just quite a waste of time. So we have a different attitude. A good attitude of being a real Buddhist is actually not really spending too much time worrying about the future. Making the present moment fine. And you find that what you have in the present moment is much more than you can you know, ever really want. It's a wonderful thing, even just to be alive now, to learn. <coughs> people are dying, but sometimes people are serving as well. So much sacrifice and service and kindness are being done by 
people in the NHS. What a wonderful world that is. So don't just look at the two bad bricks in the wall. See the 998 good bricks. Thank you, yeah. Someone else, uh, Matisha, is asking, how can the pandemic help us become dispassionate towards samsara? You don't become dispassionate towards samsara because you're in samsara, you've got to live with samsara. It's like, oh, you know, I've got a body, I'm going to be dispassionate towards, I'm not going to wash, I'm not going to eat. You've got to care for the situation you're in. But what it learns, what we learn from this, is to learn uh, that what I often say is the, the meaning of suffering, of dukkha, is asking from this world something it can't give you. So people are asking for some certainty, they're asking for um, to be healthy for every human being to be able to live you know, three score years and ten or more than that. And if they, someone dies young, there's a mistake there somewhere. It's not a mistake, this is our life, it's always been this way. And the uncertainty of this pandemic, I remember just reading from a cottage magazine from Cambridge that uh, it was... Um, Sir Isaac Newton uh, was involved, I was at Cambridge in 1665, 1666, which was the time of the Great Plague, and that was a really bad pandemic. And he uh, went over to Lincoln, uh, to Lincolnshire, to some big farm or something, and he said that was the most intellectual, intellectually um, best time of his career. So there's always some good things which come out of this. But don't always see the bad things of pandemics. These are just different opportunities and we can learn and grow so much. Okay, thanks. So Abby's asking, how can I be the best Buddhist I can be while still having a normal life and job? And is it even possible? So she's a little bit torn between the idea that maybe one has to ordain in order to make progress, but she wants to live in the world. Yeah, well, again, if you're in this world, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes you see these amazing Buddhist lay people, and sometimes you see some really scallywag Buddhist monks. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're in the lay world right now, you make it work. So there's so much stuff you can do in this world, in the job, in the family, to be kind, to, uh, to be selfless, uh, to learn a lot, and to lots of time to meditate as well. And amazing people say, I haven't got any time to meditate. You have time to eat, you have time to get on the computer. You spend as much time just with your eyes shut meditating as you do on the uh, your computer or your iPhone, then you'd be a wonderful uh, Buddhist meditator. So you can do these things. So a lot of time it's not really complaining about the situation, but learning how to use the situation. Last night one of the other monks gave a talk and he mentioned this wonderful little story about this person walking down the road and they saw a discarded mirror. This really actually looked like quite expensive mirror, but it was being thrown away. So he picked it up, put it in front of his face, and saw the image in it and said, whoa, this is ugly. So I know why the person threw away this mirror, and he threw it away as well. <laughs> okay, he laughed a little bit, so he got the joke. <laughs> <laughs> the mirror is just a mirror. But put it in front of you, you, you see your face. Is it the mirror's fault? <laughs> or is it your face's fault? COVID? It's, COVID is just a phenomenon, it's nature. So is all the problems, is it because of um, COVID or is it because of the way we look at it? Mm. Great, that's great. Okay, I've still got uh, about four questions, is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, all right, the next one is uh, from Jill. She said, in a situation where life seems um, utterly unbearable at times and having recognised that suffering is rooted in attachment... How does one then proceed towards letting go? How one proceeds towards letting go is coming into this present moment and staying long enough in this present moment to see there's everything you ever need and want right here, right now. You, everything you really need is right here. 
and maybe seems sort of a little bit tough to understand, but people who do have very chronic, severe pain, which is measured on these machines, which say that when this is really bad pain. One gentleman, which I was um, talking with some years ago, they said that his pain, and this is, you know, was done by machines, an objective measurement was the same as having your hand cut off, sorry, no, your arm cut off with a chainsaw. He was experiencing that all the time, 24-7. But he learned how to become in this moment and not to fight the pain. In other words, the emotional, the mental part of the pain was basically discarded. He still felt the feelings. But as the Buddha said, it was similar to the two darts or the two thorns. The mental dart or thorn is by far more painful than the physical thorn. Mm. And the mental part is something we can, we can deal with by learning how to let go. We do that through lots of training and meditation. And sometimes it's amazing what you can do. Mm. You can let go of pain. Lovely. All right, the next one is about jhana. So someone, uh, David from France, is saying um, that jhana could be seen to be reserved for spiritual masters who are on retreat for years and years. Um, And he's not sure it's really adaptable to everyday life. So he's asking, how can the common person integrate the practice of jhana into daily life in a practical way to make it meaningful? Uh, I know one lay person very, very closely who got into jhana when he was still a student. Can't say who he is. (laughs) But but it just shows it is possible to all this is really letting go deeply. Of course you get very deep joy and happiness. That joy and happiness is marvellous for how you can get great understandings and insights and innovate and deep meditation of some people who got Nobel Prizes after they've emerged from a deep meditation. Mm-hmm. Simply because your mind gets empowered from the uh, the absence of the hindrances after a jhana. So it brilliant. Sure enough, your inclination will be to actually want to renounce to what day because it just makes uh, the insight, the understanding of this world, you know, please excuse me, what do I want to have uh, a family for? Mm. What do I want to have money for? Why do I want to live in a world where Things are measured by how much you have, rather in monasticism, of how much you've let go of, mm-hmm. how much you don't have. So it's a totally different, uh, almost like lifestyle. And once you taste the jhana, sometimes it's really great. But it is happiness, it is peace, it is wisdom. So everyone has to do it sooner or later, so sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. So you're saying it is possible and also that it's sort of involving a change of direction, looking more at what we can let go of than um, acquiring. Yes, mm-hmm. And I say this because I do know a few people who mm-hmm. do do those jhanas here mm-hmm. in Australia. Uh, but they live a very simple life. Okay. Lovely. Just a couple more. So the next one's about rebirth. And um, Nanette is asking, do we only rebirth in a forward direction in sync with the present timeline? Or is it possible to rebirth, say, into medieval or Victorian times, or even into a parallel dimension? As a scientist, could, could Ajahn give a straight story on the logistics of rebirth? How does it work? Logistics of rebirth is understand this has nothing to do with the body. This is this momentum, this process uh, of which you've been inclining to all your life, especially towards the end of your life, just... <coughs> where you aspire towards, where you think you might find happiness. And uh, when a person passes away, depending upon their clarity of mind, which is based on their practice, what they've been doing for many years, their clarity of mind, you know, when they actually do die, I'm not talking about just before they die, when they may be in a coma and we drug to the eyeballs with morphine and stuff. I mean, after they die, there's a great deal of clarity if they have also some understanding of what they should be doing after they die, then they can actually incline towards a very beautiful, um, healthful um, rebirth, but not in sort of like um, just another world 
of uh, the human beings and animals and stuff, but even some of the Deva realms, or even better than that, into the Jhana realms. Mm. There's a huge amount of uh, stuff about rebirth, but most people, you don't talk too much about it because most people don't even believe that it's possible, which really sort of dumbfounds me. Mm. Science is there, the evidence is there. And imagine if this time of COVID, if more people believed in uh, rebirth, then there would be not so much grief when a person dies. That is just going to get me born again. Mm. Yeah. Great. So um, the last question is sort of, there's, I guess, two questions here that I could put together. Because somebody was asking about um, being a beginner and not quite knowing where to start um, to get a good understanding of the path. And someone else is asking that if one has a basic understanding of the path and what is to be done, then what are the merits of studying the suttas? In other words, do we really need to? Yeah, because many people believe they understand the path, <laughs> and they find they don't at all. <laughs> so it's great to actually have a look to see what the Buddha said. I guess some very simple teachings of uh, uh, suttas, what the Buddha actually taught, just simple things like the Eightfold Path. And you know, that's core Buddhism, which every Buddhist, who, for whatever tradition, should really um, assert that this is Buddhist teachings. And so not any crazy stuff, just straight down the line, Buddhism. And if you, that's the best place to start, but if you don't even start there, just start wherever you get inspired, where you find some peace and happiness and authenticity. Mm-hmm. In other words, something which sounds true to you, it feels true to you. You can practice it and it makes your life much better. And if you're not quite sure whether it's making you a better person or not, then ask the people you live with. <laughs> and if the people you live with say, no, you just even more pain in the butt than you were before, then you're not going on the right path. Great. So the purpose of the suttas, in a way, is to direct us into that right direction so that we actually um, change and become yeah, kinder like people. To make sure that you know that your views are just not really crazy views. Because mm, mm. well, every now and again somebody sends me videos of people who claim to be enlightened, and yep. or they're just even you know the um, the kookaburra outside on the tree is more enlightened <laughs> than they are. <laughs> and mm. so I don't know why people just and they say, oh no, this isn't really uh, the young monks aren't really interpreting the suttas correctly or there's more suttas or something but the teachings of the Buddha are pretty authentic mm. and very reliable and extremely consistent so you should be able to check your understanding your practice with uh, what the Buddha said yeah. and if there's something different there there's a bit of a worry mm. Mm. yeah because somebody else was asking me that um, some people appear to have awakened minds or pure hearts but then um, they slip back into wrong view. So I was saying, well, without right view in the first place, you can't be awakened. It was probably yeah. an overestimation. So would you say there's quite a bit of overestimation going on in Buddhist circles? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because Buddhism is popular now. Mm-hmm. Of course, Buddhism is popular. Some meditation teachers, and they want to be enlightened as well. Mm-hmm. So they bend the truth, lower the standards, and just got themselves enlightened. Yeah. And they haven't given up anything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Remember, just instead of calling it enlightened, just calling it just um, awakened, letting go, disappearing, vanishing, mm-hmm. going. Mm-hmm. Instead of just uh, being, being more, but being less, yeah. holding less, giving away more. Great. That's a good sign of someone who's on the path. Mm. Lovely. Thank you so much for that. Um, are there any parting words that you'd like to say just to encourage people over the next... Yeah. Just be the best at the moment. Enjoy the time you have. This is the only time you have, so it's amazing just how people can find happiness and joy in any place. Mm. So happiness and joy is there. It's big time in England. Yeah, you get COVID, but it's big time as well. So don't just look at the, the news of how many people have died today. Look at how many little uh, baby bunnies or little <laughs> starlings or whatever else is flying up in the sky. So keep yourself balanced and don't get negative. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Ajahn, on behalf of everybody who's asked questions. And take care. Okay. Okay. <laughs>